there just seems to be an amateur belief that a vaccine is out there somewhere. And all of us have our template of what that means. For me, it's a polio vaccine a million years ago. Is it that easy to make a vaccine and to know that it will work into next year? An overwhelmingly difficult task to make a vaccine that works. It usually takes a decade, if at all. We've been waiting for 40, 50 years for an AIDS vaccine still don't have it. So there's no guarantee we'll ever have a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2 for COVID-19. There really is no guarantee. And that is the bottom line. What, what have you learned about the cell biology of this virus and all the literature you've been reading, the work of your colleagues at UCL? What have you learned about the actual cellular, cellular activity of this virus? The virus is very good at infecting deep in the airway, so really inside the lungs. This is why it's so bad. It also has a propensity to set off alarm bells in our immune system, which makes our immune system completely overreact. So people are dying, not necessarily from the virus, but from our own overreaction to that virus. And this is what makes it so deadly. It's very contagious compared with other similar viruses. Um, and it's not as deadly. So in some ways, it's a very uh, well-adapted virus. It can spread around, uh, and when people don't know they're sick. So that's a really good recipe for a virus. You, you don't want to kill your host within two seconds. You want to sneak around and spread. And that's what this virus is very good at. So the only good thing I can say about this virus right now is that it's quite stable. So unlike influenza or HIV, it's stable. So if we do find a vaccine that works, it, it will probably be a little bit easier to keep on top of it. Um, Dr. Rohn, a number of Italian doctors say that actually this uh, coronavirus is losing potency. Is there any truth in that? Well, I've seen those anecdotal reports. They are, that, they are exactly that, anecdotal. It's one doctor's opinion of what he's seen. Um, others are disputing that this can be true. Um, there's no evidence from the genomics of the virus. So if you look at the blueprint, people are studying it spread around the world. It doesn't seem to be changing that much. Uh, I don't think there's much evidence for that. Of course, there, there isn't any evidence. So it could be true. It's probably uh, too soon to say. When do we know whether this is losing potency? Is there a worry that actually the number of infections or actually the, you know, the, the fact that it's dangerous surges with the winter? So is October and November the, the worrying months for you? I mean, I'm worried right now because we're seeing a record increase in cases this Sunday. It was announced, the WHO announced a record surge around the world. North and South America in particular are worrying. We're seeing countries that had it under control. We see Germany's R numbers going up. We're seeing outbreaks in, in Australia, uh, in New Zealand even, which had eradicated it. People are coming back in and bringing it along. So it's not even under control now. And in the winter, it could get worse, not just because we might get a second wave from the, the cold temperatures being more amenable to the virus, but also we're going to have circulating seasonal flu. I think um, having flu and coronavirus in the same patient is going to be a recipe for disaster. I mean, could something like the coronavirus just disappear one day? I don't know whether we need to look back at the Black Death or the Spanish flu to give us an indication of, of what can happen to some of these viruses. You don't have to look back that far. You can look back at SARS in 2003. It, it, it arose in 2003 and, and vanished without a trace a year later from public health measures. But SARS, the classic, SARS classic, was much less infectious. So these viruses, of course, can get under control if our R numbers are well below one. It could peter out, but I'm not, I'm not so convinced that's going to happen. Dr. Rowan, the economist Neil Dutta published this morning or late last night a list of the things closing in the states of America where the virus just is persistent and coming back. And so much of that centers <clears throat> around the belief that this is a virus that kills old people, but not those younger. What is the risk that you perceive in the cell biology of middle age and younger people from the COVID virus? Well, it's it's true that most of the deaths that we're seeing, the intensive care deaths, are amongst elderly people or people with 
comorbidities, or, you know, other kinds of, of illnesses on the top of that. But really, there is a large cohort of people they're calling long haulers, which are middle-aged or younger people who, who got coronavirus, and it keeps coming back. So they're not in intensive care, but they're very debilitated. They're, 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 they're cycling on and off of being very, very tired, uh, fevers, uh, all sorts of strange symptoms. And we really don't have a handle on how many people. I mean, I know several people like this myself. They're out there. So younger people can have problems. There was even a study showing recently that the lung, if you look at the lungs of completely asymptomatic patients, you can still see evidence that COVID has been there. So there's a lot we don't know about this virus, and it, it, we would not be wise to underestimate it. Our quarantine is from Venice in the plague, where the boats would sit offshore until they knew the people were safe to be in society. Now we have quarantines off the plane from Heathrow. Do they work? Well, clearly, if you stash people away when they arrive for two weeks, you're going to cut the risk of infection, but at what cost to the economy? I mean, we really have to balance. I think if we keep some level of social distancing, maybe people start wearing more masks and we're sensible, we, we should be able to open the economy a little bit, but not too much. I mean, if you look at what's happening in the states, 18 states are now reporting increases in infection rate after having had it under control from lockdown. We just have to tread very carefully, make little changes a little bit at a time, see what happens. You know, there's this two-week lag. We don't know if things work for two weeks, which is really frustrating. But I think we just easy does it and slowly but surely. Um, Jennifer Rohn, do masks work? In the UK, there hasn't really been that much of a campaign to get people to wear masks. In other countries, there has been. So who's right? I mean, I've been on this program saying that masks don't work, and, and there has been a bit of a sea change. It's, it's true that your average cloth mask is not going to do much. Having said that, it will block some of the larger aerosols, so if somebody sneezes in your face and you're wearing a mask, you're better off than not. It's, it's not a magic bullet, especially if you don't have one of the, the high-spec masks, which are really hard to get hold of anyway. I think a little bit of mask wearing at this point in time would not be a bad idea. And if social distancing, so if the distance is going from two meters to one meter, as it is probably in the UK in a couple of days, masks might offset that risk.